and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. And I just want to give you all a quick reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. We would ask that you consider becoming a regular contributor. Uh, you can do that by going to justincenter.org. Uh, you could sign up and help us out. So uh, we do need your funding. We need your help to be able to continue to produce the material that we do, including our seminars, publishing, podcasting, uh, and all of the other things that we consistently produce. Um, and we do have plans for growth, growth in some of the materials as well as staff um, with Justin Center. And we really do need the funding to be able to continue to do that. So uh, on the program today, we're going to be continuing our study on, on Christology as we have been looking continually through Revere Franklin Wider's volume on Christology. Again, if you want to pick up a copy of this, you can go to jspublishing.org. You can check out our publishing house there. We have all sorts of great theological materials, both old and new, um, that you can find for sale there. And we try to keep our prices down as much as, as we can um, so that these books are, are affordable and accessible. So uh, this book is part of our Complete Works of Revere Frank and Widener series, uh, which we are also in process of making into a, a four-volume dogmatics hardcover text. And I've been working on volume two in that, so uh, keep an eye out for that and for an announcement when that is going to be released. Okay, so uh, we finished last time looking at, at Western Christology, and I know that some of you will probably only be watching this podcast and not the other ones because now we're kind of jumping into the stuff that I know a lot of you have been waiting for in this series, uh, and that is jumping into the discussion surrounding the two natures of Christ in relation to the Lutheran Reformed divide at the time of of the, the Protestant Reformation. And so it is often, it's well known that the the dividing issue between the Lutheran and Reformed movements, if it could said to be that there, if you could say that there is one dividing issue, uh, I think it's a broader issue of the incarnation, uh, but really relates to Christology uh, and specifically how Christology affects how we view the Lord's Supper. Um, I do have an article I published with Modern Reformation on this topic that was pretty short, but it's, uh, if you want a, an overview of that, it was uh, last Christmas, they asked me to, to write that as they were doing some meditations on the Incarnation. Um, and I have said that I do think that the Incarnation itself is the primary point of difference between these, these two traditions, the Lutheran and the Reformed. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens at the Reformation there. Now, if you want to explore and you haven't yet, the development of Christology here, debates leading up to the Reformation. I've talked about that on all of the previous programs now leading up to this point. We've covered uh, kind of, you know, bird's eye view of the history, but we've gone into um, a, a bit of, of the debates that had happened in uh, the early church. And we looked at the Council of Nicaea, the Docetic debates. We looked at the Sibelian debates, even, um, you know, prior to Nicaea. The Docetic debate was prior to Nicaea as well. And then we looked at uh, solutions to how the divine and human natures in Christ relate to one another, the positions of Eutyches uh, and Nestorius that were rejected, the supposed compromise of monothelitism, monoenergism, which was rejected. And then we looked at the Spanish adoptionist controversy in the early medieval period. And at the end of that, I said, this is really the end of the great Christological debates until you get to the Reformation. And a, a point that I had made was that at Calcis, done, not every single point had really been addressed. The major issues at debate had been addressed. There was a statement at Chalcedon that was, was unifying, uh, unifying enough that all parties could, could agree on the points that had been made. But that doesn't mean that every single Christological issue had now been, been resolved. And we saw that with things like the Spanish Adoptionist Controversy, which was not something that was addressed specifically at Chalcedon because that idea didn't exist at the time. Um, but at the Reformation, once again, Christology really becomes the point of debate and the point of discussion between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions. Now, that doesn't mean that Rome doesn't have anything to say about this. If you look at a Robert Bellarmine, he's quite critical of the Lutheran perspective on the two natures of Christ, though certainly wouldn't come to the Calvinistic conclusion either, um, because, well, at least in terms of its implications for the Lord's Supper. Um, but uh, we're going to look at this between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions uh, specifically as we tease some of this out. All right, so let's look then at uh, the page 47, if you have this edition, uh, our edition of this book, uh, under the heading Protestantism. So we discussed uh, 
very briefly at the end of the last program, the scholastics. And essentially, it's not that there were no new developments in the scholastics, but there weren't extended debates about Christology in the scholastic era. Um, a lot of the medieval scholastics were, were repeating what had already been decided by um, the earlier councils. And yeah, there were additional, you know, clarifications and categories and things like that that were uh, developed at that time. But no, not a lot of specific doctrinal development in that particular era. So then we get to Protestantism. So what happens at the time of the Reformation? I'm just going to read. Protestantism at first put aside for a time the more complete determination of the mode of the Incarnation in order to give prominence to the practical significance to the Incarnation. Now, the practical significance of the Incarnation is certainly going to be, just like it was for the Fathers, really, it's going to be the focus in, in the Reformation uh, because the, the focus of, of Luther and Melanchthon is on Christ as he is for you, right? The, the debates going on in the medieval period are really more about Pelagianism. They're more about uh, soteriology, about Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, and then other developments in that, that general area of thinking in terms of soteriology. So the incarnation, the role that it plays, Christology is, is mostly what does it mean that Christ is for us, right? God as man is God for us. And so there is the, the implications of our Christology for how we understand justification, for how we understand our relationship to God, that God is for us and he's for us in Christ, uh, and that the incarnation leads to the, the vicarious satisfaction of Christ with his, his death on the cross. So that practical nature of incarnational theology is going to be central at first to the Reformation. The more and if, it's certainly the case that, you know, as if you've listened to our Augsburg Confession study, as we talked about Christology in the Augsburg Confession, there's really no attempt to develop anything new in Christology. It's just to say, well, we were inheritors of the earlier, you know, Augustinian tradition. Um, we are simply one with the historic church. Now we're just teasing out what some of the soteriological implications are of the incarnation and the death and resurrection of Christ consequent upon the incarnation that we feel have really been distorted and missed, especially in the late medieval period, especially with the rise of the more Pelagian-leaning uh, late nominalist thinkers. So, uh, then he cites here the Augsburg Confession, Article 3, the Son of God did take man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that there are two natures, the divine and human, inseparably conjoined in one person, one Christ, true God, true man. So, here is just a kind of reiteration of the basic points of, of Chalcedon. So they're basically just saying, hey, when it comes to Christology, we're just adopting what everyone always taught about Christology. Uh, we're not teaching anything new. We're just inheritors of the classical tradition, which really extends both East and West. It's going to end up that uh, Lutheran Christology actually is more Eastern than it is Western, but we're just part of the great tradition of the church. No, nothing distinctive about us here. Uh, they're trying to they're trying to shut down those who are trying to associate Lutheranism with every possible heresy. Uh, you see that yeah, Johann Eck does this. He just kind of throws every possible heresy at Luther and kind of sees what sticks. <laughs> so, so accusations of Arianism randomly show up and they're like really bizarre. And uh, you'll, I, I've actually seen this occasionally, not often, but I've seen this occasionally even from Roman Catholic apologists today, uh, particularly kind of the state of a contest, really extreme types who just go overboard and say, Luther said this thing about the incarnation, denied the incarnation, and it, it, no serious Luther scholar holds to any of that. Um, and, and most of those accusations have disappeared at this point because it's just not true. Um, but occasionally in some, especially online polemics with some kind of extreme state of a contest types, you'll run into that. Um, but uh, the Reformation just inherits what was the earlier tradition. And it wasn't a point of it wasn't a point of departure from from the medieval church, so they weren't trying to make say anything different. Um, but then, okay, the controversy concerning the Lord's Supper led to giving prominence in confessional expression to the elements of the most thorough fellowship of the two sides involved in Luther's Christology. See the epitome of the formula of Concord, Article Eight. And then he has the quest, a quote here. The chief question has been whether, because of the personal union, the divine and human natures as also their properties, have really, that is, in deed and truth, a communion with one another in the person of Christ, and how far this communion extends. Okay, so 
we're talking about the union of the two natures of Christ. And as I said at Chalcedon, Chalcedon makes the it makes the declaration that there is an inseparability of the two natures of Christ. Uh, that they're inseparable, but that they are also not mixed. They do not become one nature as Eutyches taught, where he used this analogy of like a drop of oil as the human nature of Christ being dropped into an ocean. And it basically just, with the, the vastness of the ocean, it kind of ceases to really exist in any meaningful sense because it's just totally dispersed and swallowed up by the ocean. And this is how he sees the, the relationship between divine and human nature. So that's rejected. And the separation of natures that you see in Nestorius is rejected. But we are still left with the question, how, in the one person, how do those natures relate to one another? Um, what is the nature of that inseparability? Does that inseparability mean that the human nature has attributes of divinity working in and through it? Or is there still this strong distinction between the two natures in the sense of their operations? So that, for example, and this is going to be the example, the, the omnipresence of Christ is only referred to the divine nature, but not the human nature. Or our worship and veneration of Christ, is that only toward the divine nature and not the human nature? So those are the kinds of questions that Chalcedon wasn't really meant to answer. And so we have different strains of Christology that lead up to Chalcedon that don't really see themselves being totally worked out until this point. So I don't think what's happening here is anything particularly new. And what Calvinist thinkers are going to point out is what we call the extra Calvinisticum, which is what Lutheran theologians refer to as the, the Reformed view of, of uh, how these two natures relate. Uh, there are a lot of Reformed thinkers that are going to say, look, we're the I've heard them say it's the extra patristicum because you can find this in the church fathers and I point, point to certain passages in the fathers and Lutheran theologians consistently have, we've pointed to um, certain fathers that have made very explicit statements that are, are, defend our Christological positions. They don't use the same terms that we do, but the ideas are certainly there in terms of a divinization of the, of the humanity of Christ, uh, the human nature of Christ. So especially Cyril of Alexandria, the Cappadocians, Athanasius, and John of Damascus are going to be the, the major ones on those points. So the reality is, though, that both strains of thought exist in the patristic era. This is just a debate that hasn't worked itself out yet. So neither side, and, and I say this when we want to, the Lutherans, we want to call the Reformed Nestorian, and the Reformed want to call Lutherans Monophysites. And we go back and forth with the name calling uh, on this or that. But the reality is both strains of thought exist at the time of Chalcedon. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to say that the Reformed position naturally leads toward Nestorianism. I think it does. Is it an explicit Nestorianism? No. Uh, and the Reformed certainly would say the, that our position leads towards a monophysitism, when I would say no, that's not true. But to, to be honest here, I think intellectually, we have to say that neither position is explicitly condemned at Chalcedon. And they're both strains of the earlier patristic tradition. And where this really works itself out is, I think, where you see an inconsistency in perhaps some of the tradition, which is the question of how this relates to the Lord's Supper. So what the Calvinists do is take their particular Christology, their view of, of the relationship between the two natures, and then apply it to the Lord's Supper. And in doing so, they come up with a perspective on the Lord's Supper that is not in the tradition of the church. And I think what it becomes pretty clear is that it is only the Lutheran position which really makes any sense with what is the historic and ultimately biblical uh, position on the Lord's Supper, that in the Lord's Supper we receive the true body and blood of Christ here, not I ascend into heaven, into the heavenlies and receive them in some mysterious way far off, uh, but Christ comes down just in the manner of incarnation, as Christ does, as God comes down to us, he does so in, in the elements of, of bread and wine, uh, which are now the body and blood of Christ as they are received in Holy Communion. All right, so this debate shows up first at, at the Marburg Colloquy. So you have two simultaneous reformations happening. So you've got Luther's Reformation in, in Germany, and then the Swiss Reformation begins with Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli himself at least claims that he has no influence of Luther. He just, this whole Reformation thing, he just started himself in Switzerland. I don't know the validity of that, but that was at least Zwingli's claim. 
And so you have these two different parties, and they have a very different view of reform, I think, in a number of ways. This is just what comes out, but there's more than just this. And there is the Marburg Colloquy, which is a time when representatives of both parties kind of come together to discuss. Luther's not very hopeful about this and is not that interested. Zwingli is certainly more interested in this, but Luther is not impressed with what he's seen from Zwingli. And they go through a number of doctrinal points to say, do we agree on this? Do we agree on that? And yeah, they agree on everything but the Lord's Supper. Uh, at least all of the points that were explicitly named. Now, I think that this ends up being something far beyond a difference on the Lord's Supper. And the way that a lot of the Reform tend to paint the Marburg Colloquy, at least in teachings that I've that I've heard, is Luther, you know, they just agreed on basically everything. It was just like this minor difference on the mode of Christ's presence. Luther was just being obnoxious, and Lutherans are so stuck on one theological point. And what really happened at the Marburg Colloquy is these people that were brothers in Christ and believed all the same things um, and just couldn't come together because Luther was being so nitpicky about one particular minutia of theology. I, I, I totally disagree with that interpretation of the Marburg Colloquy. I think that's that's very off. And, and I can see why you would come to that conclusion there's just one theological difference. But the one theological difference that was discussed actually ends up demonstrating, I think, an entirely different approach to divinity and humanity in Christ and how we view the world in general. And so it's a question of how the infinite relates to the finite, how God relates to humanity. It's a much bigger question than simply the mode of Christ's presence at the Lord's Supper. That's just the particular theological point at which the broader underlying differences really, really came about. So what happens at the Marburg Colloquy, uh, you have Luther and Zwingli, again, they're not the only ones there, but they're, of course, the two kind of chief proponents of their of their positions. And you got Bootser, who's kind of this, trying to be this mediating party, just as Calvin in some ways kind of is later, uh, who still doesn't diverge from Zwingli's main point, though. So he's not really much of a mediating party, but he, I think, sees himself that way. So they're de- Luther and Zwingli are debating the nature of the words of Christ, this is my body. Uh, and what does this mean? And Luther says, no, it literally means this is my body. When Jesus says, this is my body, the bread that he's holding is his body. When he says, this is my blood, uh, that what's in that cup is the blood of Christ, and that's what you receive in the supper. So Luther is being, he's a, he's a literalist in terms of the words of institution, and he is being consistent with the accepted tradition. Now, he's not using the language of transubstantiation and all the baggage. He's trying to be more just explicitly biblical in how he formulates this. Um and Zwingli, in response, argues that no, this is symbolic. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, Jesus is it's basically just saying um, this is a symbol of my body. It is not actually his body. And, you know, you could debate the words of institution and the grammar that's going on there. But ultimately, what happens in the Marburg Colloquy is they get underneath that difference and get to what is really driving Zwingli's perspective on the Lord's Supper. Because you ask, you know, why is Zwingli so darn insistent that this couldn't be the body of Christ? Like, what, what's what's kind of in it for him? What's the what's the impetus behind being so adamant on that on that particular point? And there, there are essentially two things that Zwingli says here to define his position and why he comes to that conclusion. Uh, the first is the ascension. That it's often said that Luther is the literalist. The difference is Luther is a literalist and Zwingli is not a literalist. It's actually kind of not true. They're both literalists in one sense. (laughs) Okay, so uh, Zwingli's a literalist in that he says, when we speak about Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father, what we're confessing is that there is a literal, particular, specific location at the right hand of God the Father where Jesus' humanity is seated and it is not anywhere else. So this notion of Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father as he ascends, he's taking that in the most literalistic sense that Jesus is confined, according to his human nature, to that particular locale. And he will be confined to that locale until his return. So he uses that, his literalistic interpretation of of that passage in the ascension to say, therefore, Christ cannot be present on the altar. Because he can't be, he physically can't be. His body is 
because of the ascension, located specifically physically at one particular location, and he cannot be anywhere else. So that's uh, that's the argument that that Zwingli wants to make. And Luther says no. Uh, you know what Jesus says: "This is my body." There is no indication that that is to be understood as anything other than what is the most straightforward reading. But then he goes on to say, you know, in terms of the ascension, we understand, and of course we all know this, that, you know, God uses human kind of language to describe himself to us. So we all recognize that there are things about God that he describes to us that we don't take in the most literalistic sense. So saying, saying it's not literalistic is not to say we don't take it seriously or for what it says. Um, but, for example, you know, God talks about his nostrils at a couple different points in the Old Testament, you know, because he smells. He smells the incense, the sweet-smelling incense. Well, we recognize God doesn't literally have nostrils, but that's that's anthropomorphic language. So it's, it's speaking in terms of about who God is in human categories that help us to grasp the broader truth un underneath. So scripture says things like, well, God repents. Scripture also says God doesn't repent and can't repent. So there we look at that and say, oh, there's a contradiction. Well, no, I mean, you have one point where it's in like the same chapter that <laughs> it's both are said. Uh, no, the point is he does, human repentance is an analogy, right? It's something that, that we grasp onto to understand how God is communicating to us. But it's not taken in the God repents as a human repents as if he didn't know it was going to happen or he makes a mistake or he sins or something. That's that's not certainly not the case. So when we're talking about the right hand of the Father, then we can ask, well, does this refer to a literal specific location? Um, or is this instead to be understood in some other sense? Well, what's the other sense by which this could be understood? Uh, and, you know, that's where Luther says, well, like clearly right hand of the father, you know, we talk about someone being at someone else's right hand uh, as, as a seat of authority. I mean, we still have this phrase, someone's right hand man. I mean, that still exists in our culture today. Um, so the one who is at the right hand is sharing the seat of authority. So this is a, a statement about Christ's glorification. And we're not saying Jesus didn't literally ascend, but is the point of his being at the right hand of the father, is the point of that to say specifically, that there is a confined locale at which Christ's humanity is. And I mean, if you want to think this super literalistically, well, maybe the Father literally has a hand, and it's a literal right hand, and the Father's sitting on a throne, and Jesus is sitting on a throne, and maybe the Holy Spirit's sitting on a throne on the other side. You know, like, if you want to take it so liter literalistically, or is this merely a phrase to say, no, Christ is seated, he has authority, he's now exalted, he is not... Um, in this state of humiliation here on the earth, now he has experienced this this great exaltation, where now he has been uh, he has been exalted, uh, and he is now seated in this seat of authority. So he's no longer in that state of humiliation at the ascension. And so Luther takes this this latter position to say, no, we take the words of institution seriously as they are, and understand that this sitting at the right hand of the Father is not. It's not about the location of Jesus' human body, especially a specified, limited location of Jesus' body. You're really missing the entire point of what the ascension's about. And, and further, you know, this is, because I know that, you know, I kind of anticipate somebody listening to this and saying, okay, well, that's, so, so how do you determine what's, what's literalistic and what's not because it seems kind of arbitrary right the calvinists just say well this is literalistic and this isn't and the lutherans say the opposite so how do we actually know how do we know which to choose maybe we need the infallible roman magisterium to make any sense of what scripture <laughs> what scripture says well no i would say we actually have some explicit and luther's going to point to this and, and other lutheran theologians are going to point to this is that we actually have some pretty explicit texts that tell us what's going on in the ascension in a way that certainly conveys that we're not talking about a, a location of Jesus's human body that limits him. So uh, one example of this is Ephesians chapter four, uh, verse nine. Here. Well, let me just start at verse seven, just to get context here. Um, I'm reading the New King James. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? 
that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. So he's talking about the descension of Christ and the ascension of Christ. Um, the humiliation and exaltation of Christ as we usually categorize these things in theology. And he says this in verse 10. He who descended from the heavens to the earth is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens. So he, we're talking about the ascension here explicitly. That he might fill all things. So the, how Paul explains the ascension isn't Christ ascends and is now stuck in a limited place for a while. No, but Paul says as he ascends, now he fills all things by means of the ascension. And this, so we're talking here about the spatial location of Jesus's nature in the descension and ascension. And in this one place where we have this explicitly laid out, the language is of filling all things, not of being limited. It's, it's precisely the opposite. So, it, and Jesus, you know, Paul doesn't say this about, no, it's Jesus's human nature that is... Uh, that is limited, but his divine nature fills all things. Because, and that doesn't make sense with our with our systematic theology. If you believe that Christ's divine nature was not somehow lost at the incarnation, if if you're not a canonicist, at least an extreme canonicist, then you would say that well, no. According to his divine nature, Christ always filled all things. So what's the change, right? There's some shift at the ascension. Something changes about his filling all things. So what's the change? Well, now his Humanity also fills all things because we're talking about the, the God-man, the one who descended, who became man, he now fills all things. So if you're talking about the divine nature and you're going to say that this is just a relation, it's about the divine nature, uh, then you're going to have to say that somehow the divine nature didn't fill all things before and then you're led into some problems about divine immutability and other things. Um, the other solution that I've seen proposed to this from a Reformed perspective is to say the filling of all things is um, is really the filling of his influence or something rather than, than his being or his humanity. So his influence fills all things. It, that's just not what the text says. And the text specifically is talking about a physical ascension. So we're talking about spatial location as we get into this this phraseology that he fills all things. So I think you have a hard time with that particular interpretation. Uh, then we have in, uh, you know, even in, in Matthew 28, we have the, the the Great Commission. Jesus is right, you know, he's, he's about to ascend into heaven. And he, he gives the Great Commission to his disciples. And he says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, what we have in the ascension of Jesus is he physically ascends, and so he's not with his disciples in some way. He's gone. He's not physically there in the way that they see him now walking around and talking to them. But he still says, I am with you always. Who is that speaking? He's speaking with a, with a human mouth and human voice. He does not say, my divine nature is with you always. He does not say, the Holy Spirit is with you always. That's how some people interpret that text. If it's the Holy Spirit, is that an I? You know, you could become a kind of modalist if you push this. He's saying, no, I am with you always. So we see the twofold nature of what happens in the ascension in the event itself, that on the one hand, Christ ascends, but on the other hand, he's still always with us in some other way. And, and that's where Lutheran theologians start to develop this notion of multiple kinds of presence. And I know the Reformed often criticized this idea that Christ could have these multiple modes of presence because they say, oh, you're just kind of making up these theological categories that aren't taken from Scripture. Well, not really. We're just grabbing onto what happens here. Clearly, in some way, he's gone because he is. He ascends to heaven. But then in some way, he still says he's here. So we've got two modes of presence that Jesus gives us. And then we could talk about the sacramental mode of presence as well. Uh, but that's really just the nature, the, the, the fact of taking Scripture seriously and saying, when it says that there's some way in which he's here and in some way which he's not, that means there have to be two different modes of presence. One is the physical walking with us, we talk to him uh, and we see him visibly. That clearly was part of Christ's humiliation and will be like that again in, in, the, in glory. But we don't have that now, but that doesn't mean that Christ is not with us in some other way. So we have another sense in which Christ is, is present. All right.
so that is the first part of Zwingli's argument, is the nature of the ascension. So that's going to be a major point of debate. But then the second, even more essential point for Zwingli, and I think this is really where that even comes from, is not just a how he reads the ascension texts, but it's an underlying principle, a philosophical axiom, metaphysical axiom, that the finite is not capable of the infinite. So for Zwingli, the finite is not capable of the infinite uh, because that would be a contradiction for the finite to contain the infinite. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So uh, in light of that, he says that the properties of the infinite of God cannot be exercised through the human nature so that the human nature cannot be, say, omnipresent if we're talking about the Lord's Supper because that's the topic under discussion. So if you were to say that there was this comprehensive presence of Christ's humanity, now you've equated something infinite with something finite, and that's a logical impossibility. Here's where I think you see the real key difference between the two traditions, in that the Lutheran Reformation is, is very much an incarnational faith. It is a, a faith that accepts the mystery of the incarnation and says, no, the in the incarnation itself, the infinite has come down into the finite and fills the finite. And that changes, I think, the way we see all sorts of things. It certainly changes the way we see our sacramental theology. Because in, in Luther's view, God has tied himself to finite things so tightly. He has bound himself to physical means. He has bound himself to the physical world. And that some, doesn't negate God's infinity. Luther isn't saying God stops being infinite. This is the mystery of the incarnation. There's a mystery of the union of infinite and finite coming together at, at the incarnation. So that's what we talk about God's working through the means of grace. God is constantly working through the sacraments. Uh, and, you know, we're not fearful of, of talking about baptism saving because it may attribute salvation to some finite physical thing. Well, no, it's the, the infinite God uniting himself to the finite physical, ordinary, boring element of water and working in and through that to save. So I think this also... Um, leads to a different approach to things like the arts that we find in a Calvinistic perspective versus a more sacramental one, because this isn't just Lutheran, but, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, even the most sacramental of the Reforms being the Anglicans um, or the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholic traditions is there is a rich history of, of art. There is a rich history of of music and recognizing the beauty of the finite means to express God and who he is. And that's, I think, missing in some ways from a lot of the Reformed worship, uh, where you don't have imagery, you don't have anything d displayed, because it's, it's very much a focus on the intellect and the inner self, rather than the kind of outward forms of art, uh, that's all seen as idolatry. There's always kind of a danger in the outward things. Um, so this, I think, has bro a broader impact. Now, I did a whole hour-long podcast on that. And I th it was something like the chief difference between Lutheran and Reformed traditions or something where I outlined this in some, some detail if you want to see more, uh, more of that. All right, so there you have the basic differences between Luther and Zwingli that lead to this, the inter-Protestant debates surrounding the two natures of Christ. All right, let's, there, here's a quote here from, um, from our confessions from the epitome of the, the formula of Concord, which says this, by this, our doctrine, faith, and confession, the person of Christ is not divided as it was by Nestorius, who denied the true communion of properties of both natures in Christ and thus separated the person. Neither are the natures together with their properties confounded with one another or mingled into one essence as Eutyches aired. So they're saying, you know, it, even though the Reformed are saying that we're Eutychian, we're not. Neither is the human nature in the person of Christ denied or extinguished, but nor is either creature changed into the other, but Christ is and remains for all eternity, God and man, 
in one undivided person. So they're countering what, what is the challenge that the Reformed often offer that say, um, you're just conflating the two natures and you're denying the existence of humanity because you're saying that there are now are divine properties of humanity, and if you've said that, it's no longer humanity. Uh, and this is like, if you read like Charles Hodge, he makes this argument. And he basically says, well, the Lutherans deny the humanity of Christ because the human nature by definition cannot be omnipresent. And if Christ's human nature is omnipresent, then it cannot be human in any real sense. And my, my retort to that would be that, well, Hodge is using a preconceived nature the definition of human nature and then determining his theology by what he has conceived of as his definition of human nature, which is kind of backwards. And, and I don't think we operate that way in theology. Instead, we should say, well, if God designed human nature and he has told us that Christ is man, then, and Christ is omnipresent, if those truths are, are biblically verifiable and, and exegetically uh, the, the most tenable solution to various texts, which I think is the case, then we don't get to say that Jesus isn't human because we have defined humanity in a different way. So is it the case that God defines humanity by his limited locale? I, do, I don't see that being the case at all. And, and I mean, I don't know what the glorified human body is like, you know, in, in glory. Will we be limited in physical location in the same way that we are now? Um, I, I mean, I don't know, but likely not. And if that's the case, does that mean we're not human anymore? I mean, according to that kind of definition you find in Hodge, then that would be the case. And, and that's just, I think we're going far beyond the kind of data that we're actually given. It's to define human nature so narrowly to say, that in order to be a human nature, it has to be limited in its location. I just, I just don't see that. Okay. Um, the teaching of Luther. Luther demands in the interest of faith, which grasps Christ, that both natures should be thought of as completely inseparable. So the inseparability of the two natures is really going to be the focus against Zwingli, who tends toward a more Nestorian perspective. Now, I will say that I think Zwingli is far more Nestorian than later Reformed authors are. I think when you get to Calvin and later writers, Beza is actually pretty off, but uh, Beza tends toward an historian view as well. But I think the majority of Reformed writers are far more balanced than that. But we do get some real Nestorian tendencies in Zwingli. And, and I would even say it's someone like R.C. Sproul, who I love in so many ways, really tends to be pretty Nestorian in the way that he explains the natures of Christ. Um, so there is that tendency, I think, to lean in that direction in the Reformed, uh, in the Reformed Church, though I think there's more balance than that in a, in a lot of theologians, especially when they really have to hash these issues out with Lutherans. Okay, on John 1, 14, Luther says, The word became flesh is equivalent to this. The Son of God is become the Son of Man. The everlasting Son of the Father has become a Son in time. The Son who was in the original beginning has become a Son with an earthly beginning. We, sure, we have a sure Lord whom we can grasp and who out of an infinite God has become a finite, incomprehensible man. A beautiful statement. Beautiful. And this is very patristic. Uh, we looked at some of the patristic statements before. If you read the early Christian apologists, they love this kind of language. They, they revel in that, that mystery, the, the mystery of the incomprehensibility of how all of this works. You see this in uh, Athenagoras, for example, as he writes about the the impassable becoming passable. Ignatius uses that kind of language as well. That the one who cannot suffer suffers for us. There, there's delight and, and awe and wonder in this kind of mystery that Luther has that's very, very patristic and I think very biblical. Both are now one thing, one being. Hence it is said with justice, this man is God. You could point to Jesus and say, he is God. Um, God is this man as well. And we see examples of, of this in scripture. Uh, that, you know, Jesus says with his human mouth, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He doesn't say my divine nature was. No, he's saying I am God with his human voice, <laughs> with his vocal cords, with those finite vocal cords, he is confessing to be the infinite. There's the beauty and the mystery there. Um, uh, Okay, so uh, where God is, there is also the man. This is important. We cannot encounter 
and this is what you have, and if, and if you like Zwingli's, that you are encountering, when you encounter Christ on this earth, you encounter the divinity of Christ because the humanity of Christ can't be there. And he's, he's saying, no, when you encounter Christ, you receive him as the God-man. You receive him as divine and human. It is the God-man who redeemed you. I don't just encounter Christ in throughout the universe, anywhere I encounter him, except for this one limited place, and encounter just divinity outside of humanity. No, I encounter the God-man. So if if I am receiving Christ, say, in Holy Communion, um, it, if Christ is really present in where two or three are gathered, if Christ is really living in me, as you know, Paul talks about in Galatians, if the what we call the mystical union of the believer with Christ, if all of that is true, and the Christ that I know is the God Man who died according to his his flesh, with that flesh to save me, because my mediator and savior is only the God Man, not the eternal Logos, divorced from the flesh, or Asarkos. No, I'm redeemed by the God Man. So if I am receiving the God-man in any way, I am receiving him as the God-man, divinity and humanity. So we can't divorce those two and say, well, I just encounter Christ's divine nature and I'll maybe see his human nature someday uh, in, in heaven. It's not how scripture presents this and it's not how we understand our savior. Now I know the reformed are gonna retort and respond and say, well, we still encounter the God-man, we just only encounter him according to his divinity, but he still is the one who's hypostatically united to the humanity. Uh, and I just, it convolutes things so much. And you're not, you're, the, the bottom line is you're not encountering the divinity of Christ or the humanity of Christ when you encounter Christ in a Reformed perspective. You can't. Yes, you're encountering the divinity of one who is also hypostatically united to the humanity that is elsewhere. But you're not really encountering him as the God-man as you encounter Christ on this earth. In nearly any interaction you have, in any way you receive him, whether it's sacramental or through the word or in terms of the mystical union or whether it's through a fellowship in the body of Christ or whatever it might be. And I think that's a problem biblically. And I think it's a problem in terms of our Christian experience because I don't think we think that way. So this is a great principle that we see in Luther. And this is the kind of principle that wasn't laid out at Chalcedon. So you see, this is something that this was not a point in debate yet. So where God is, there also is the man. What God does, that the man also does. And what the man does and suffers, God does and suffers. So there is one personal agent that is acting, that is the God-man. Again, speaking of the inseparableness of the two natures, Luther says, Where Christ is, there is he a natural person, and, there, and is there also naturally and personally as is clearly shown by his conception. If he now was natural and personal where he is, he must there be man also, for there are not two divided persons, but only one person. Where it is there, it is the one undivided person. And where thou canst say, here is God, thou must also say, Christ, the man is also there. And if thou shouldst show one place where God is and the man is not, the person would be divided. That's the argument. And I think it's a good one and a compelling one and a convincing one. Because you are divided. This is the question. Is If Chalcedon says that the person is not divided, are you dividing Christ if you are saying, there's God, but there's not man? Now you have divided him to say, here is where I encounter God, but man is not also there. Because then I could say with truth, here is God, who was not man and never became man. Out of this would follow that time and space sunder the two natures from each other, Great, great point. Um, it, it's really, I really think Luther's, and I think Luther's line of argument sounds very patristic as well as he as he's speaking here. And divide the person which yet death and the devil could not separate nor tear from each other. And he would be a miserable Christ to me who would be a divine and human person at one place only. Exactly, precisely. And at all other places would be a mere sundered God a divine person without humanity. No, friend, where thou placest God to me, thou must at the same time place humanity to me. They cannot be sundered and separated from each other. They have become one person and does not throw off the humanity from itself 
as Master Han strips off his coat and lays it aside when he goes to sleep. He's got a beautiful way with words. Uh, and you can see here the, the, the passion of what Luther is trying to get at here. And you, you can see here why this is not merely like a trifle about the mode of presence in communion. No. He's saying, according to Zwingli's theology, when I encounter God, I don't encounter him as the redeemer who redeemed me. I encounter him as a divine nature, which is terrifying to me because I'm a sinner. What I need is to encounter the God-man. I need to encounter the one who suffered and died, the infinite who became finite for me. That's who I need to encounter when, when I encounter Christ. That's what Luther's getting at here. It's powerful. It's a powerful argument. And I think you see the pastoral practical nature of what he's getting at. This is not mere theoretics, which it sounds like it is in some of these later debates, but it's not. And Luther has a the pastoral heart, and you see this so profoundly in how he articulates this, which maybe is not as easy to see when you get into some of the, the polemics of the next century. Uh, as much as I love the polemics of the next century after this, but <laughs> okay. Uh, from this follows the communicatio idiomatum. The communicatio idiomatum, the communication of attributes. This is a term, Latin term, communicatio idiomatum, that you're going to see a lot in Lutheran Christology, Christological writings. The fellowship of the attributes in the person. In the person, the divine nature is in fellowship with the human and the human with the divine, Luther says. What is said of him, or Christ, as man, that also must be said of God. To wit, Christ has died, and Christ is God, therefore God has died. So we can say that God has done this if we can attribute it to the person because the person is God and the person is also man. So we don't get just to say a nature died. That would be the Nestorian error. Otherwise, with all his holiness and the shedding of his blood and his dying, he could not take one sin from us or quench in the least the fire of hell. The point is, if Jesus is just, say, and this is certainly clarified, especially in later Reformed thought. Later Reformed thought, as I said, is much better than Zwingli on this point. Um, but because Zwingli seems to basically say, well, if Scripture, you know, kind of attributes something to God, it really is just using that as a stand-in for man, for his humanity. Uh, and yeah, you you fall you fall into all sorts of, uh, I think, dangerous traps when you do that. Which is why I think Zwingli really, really does tend toward an historianism, really. I mean, it, pretty clearly, I think. And I think you have a hard time. I know people have tried to re refute that, but I think with some of Zwingli's statements, you have a really hard time getting around it because it certainly sounds that way. Um, so, um, what, you, what you see here then, as Luther is, is expressing this in the Communicatio Idiomatium, is all of the work of the God-man is the work of the whole person. So we don't get to just say, this work is a work of the Father, or sorry, the, the, of the... <laughs> Now I'm thinking of the inseparability of the operations of the Trinian Godhead, but um, you don't get to say that this work is a work of the human nature or a work of the divine nature. No, it's the work of Christ. It may be a work that's that's according to the human nature or according to the divine nature. Um, you know, in other words, as as you know, the eternal logos, he cannot die because that's against God's nature. But as the infinite has united itself to the finite, he does die, though according to the human nature according to the humanity. In the same way, we do offer him worship. We can worship Christ without worrying or fearing and saying, I'm just worshiping the divinity of Christ, not the humanity of Christ. No, it's, it's the God-man. It's the divine person. So we worship him. You don't have to fear worshiping the human nature of Christ. The saints in Revelation certainly don't seem to have an issue with that. All right, and that's and the only way that that makes sense, by the way, is if the finite is capable of the infinite. Because if it's not true that the finite is capable of the infinite, and only the infinite should be worshipped, you shouldn't be worshipping before the humanity of Christ. Because that's idolatry. Which Beza goes on to actually assert, bizarrely enough. But that's, that's the inevitable conclusion. And ultimately, what Lutherans are going to continue to say is if you take this principle to its logical conclusion, you lose the incarnation. The entire basis of the Christian faith is that the infinite becomes finite. And this principle overthrows the entirety of the gospel. Now, they're also going to say there's a felicitous inconsistency in the Reformed, that they don't apply the principle that broadly, but if they were going to consistently apply the principle that broadly, they would deny the gospel. 
Not saying that they do, but that's the natural conclusion of that principle when you're using that as the driving force of your theology, which Zwingli does. Okay. I'm going to read the next little paragraph here. Um, this is the glory of our Lord God, that he lets himself down so lowly into flesh. Thus Luther brings both natures to an actual reciprocal unity of life in order to attain a real and complete unity of person. And this holds goods from the very beginning, good from the very beginning of his human life. And one thing I was going to just mention here as as we're talking about this that I didn't, didn't mention is, and I should have done that when I read the last quote, but uh, that is that the if, if I encounter the, the divinity without the humanity, what I am encountering is a, a divine nature without the means by which he takes away the barrier between me and him, which is sin. And the way that he takes away that barrier is by his taking on human flesh, his suffering in human flesh for my sins, and also his deification of humanity, his, his bringing of humanity into communion with the Father, his glorifying and exalting humanity through his person, that now I can be in fellowship with the Father as Jesus is in fellowship with the Father. And this is why this connection between deification and this communication of attributes, this is why the Eastern Fathers tend to be much more clear on this point, because these are interconnected. Because if if in order for a person to be in any way divinized, if that meant that to be divinized or to experience theosis is to lose your humanity, uh, then I certainly can't be divinized and Jesus can't be divinized either. So he can't, it, it, you see this, because even my own experience of the mystical union with God my, my own experience of my Christian sanctification, my Christian life, is God working in and through me. It is the infinite coming into the finite. Not in a, in a hypostatic sense, as in Christ, of course. But if you have the finite is not capable of the infinite, the strict division between God and man, that you're fearful of conflating the two all the time, if that's the case, you can't have any kind of theosis kind of talk at all because that's always blurring the line between creature and creator. Whereas if it's the case that the infinite works to the finite, well, the distinction between God and man still remains as distinct as ever without conflation of natures, then we don't have to have the fear in the same way. Um, but in terms of the cross then, if you're saying that this is just the humanity of Christ, as Zwingli seems to do at times, then, especially dealing with the passage which says we crucified the Lord of glory, where he kind of says, eh, that's just kind of a stand-in for his humanity. If that's the case, and it just a human nature dies and not a divine person who has a human nature, then you just have a person in your stead. Like, you, yeah, you've got a perfect person dying in your place, but you don't have one who is infinite. So the, the reason why the cross can cover the sins of all people at all times, even though it was one man's death, is because of the unity of the infinite and the finite. So because if the infinite Godhead is united to the finite humanity, and, and that God-man has, according to both natures, partaken of this act of atonement, then the death of that humanity, because of the union of natures and the hypostatic union, is one that is also infinite. And so this is why we don't need to repeat the sacrifice of Jesus as the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be repeated over and over again. The reason it's a once for all sacrifice is because it is the infinite eternal God who was at work here in this sacrifice. And so if we start to say just the human nature of Christ died, now you're denying the grounds by which the death of Christ actually benefits us. So you see on, on two ends here, you've got a, hum, a divinity without a humanity when we encounter Christ in Zwingli's view. And then on the cross, we essentially have a humanity dying by itself without a divinity. 
The divine is there, united with him as one person, but only a nature dies. And if we rend asunder the two natures in the way that Zwingli does, you essentially undermine the entirety of the gospel. The whole Christian message just falls apart at that point. So that's what you see in, in Luther here. That's really, really key to understanding his theology as a whole. That his Christology is key to all of his theology. As David Scare says, all theology is Christology. And I think he's right. That Christian theology is all is all Christology. I mean, it's all centered on Christ. That's how we know God. And yes, we could talk about natural theology and stuff, but Christian theology, revealed theology, really centers on Christ and is all seen through the lens of Christ. And if you mess that up, you mess the whole thing up. Uh, and that's why Christological heresy is such a big deal in the early church. And Luther's recognizing that we're starting to, the reformers are starting to go in one of those directions again. And he's trying to stop that. And he recognizes that's not a mere trifle. So when Luther, it's when he tries to shake Luther's hand and Luther says no, and doesn't shake his hand of fellowship. I don't think it's just Luther being mean, but it's Luther recognizing that they're really not approaching this from the same perspective. And that Zwingli didn't get the incarnation right. And you, you can't have a healthy church as much as you want unity. And unity's good. God wants unity in the church. But you can't have unity that sacrifices something as essential as the incarnation of Christ and gets it so wrong. Um, okay, so again, the reform tend to get a lot better after Zwingli. I think Zwingli is more extreme, um, but they don't really over, ever overcome, I think, the fundamental issue with Zwingli. And that's going to be my argument. <laughs> so, but we'll see that played out as we move on. So next, we're going to be looking at um, the formula of Concord. So that's Luther on uh, the, the two natures and, and the communication of attributes. Then we're going to look at the teaching of the formula of Concord. So we're looking at the end of the, the 16th century as the categories have kind of solidified here as to how theologians are going to talk about this, especially in debate with the reform. Um, so thank you so much for watching and or listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and make sure you subscribe on your podcast app as well, uh, where these are also posted. we got video and audio. And uh, actually, it seems more recently like our, our base is kind of half and half, half video, half audio. So that's that's good. Um, so uh, make sure you do that. And we'll see you in the next one. We'll be continuing this series. I don't know about next week, but we'll be continuing it soon. So God bless. Bye.